Do you behave differently around different people? I remember when I was in high school, uh, I would act one way around all the guys, you know, that I knew, my buddies, my friends. Uh, I would act another way around my parents. I would act still a different way around other adults, especially, of course, my teachers. And uh, yet, even another way around certain girls that I wanted to impress. Hey, how you doing? Now, the way that other people thought about me, especially those cute girls, was very, very important to me. I wanted to impress people especially those cute girls. Now that I'm old, I don't really care anymore. I don't care what people think about me. I'm just my grumpy old man self to everybody. Uh, I'd like to think I was joking, but uh, don't know. But what about you? Do you behave differently around different people? Do you behave one way around your family? around your friends, maybe around your coworkers, maybe around your colleagues. Well, what, what's going on? Are you a hypocrite or something? Or are you just trying to be all things to all people? Well, you know, the Apostle Paul was well noted for behaving differently around different people. He behaved one way around Jews, he behaved another way around Gentiles. He even behaved differently around different church congregations. And that resulted in uh, some people, especially some Christians in the city of Corinth, thinking of the Apostle Paul as a hypocrite. And they questioned his authority as an apostle. Well, in our pericope today, we're going to notice the Apostle Paul's explanation of why he behaved differently around different people and how he refutes these allegations of hypocrisy and challenges to his apostolic authority. But now we as Christians today want to consider some of the principles that Paul mentions with regard to his behavior because it informs us as to how we should seek to interact positively with people who are not Christians. So let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. I'm going to read through verse 18 and then come back and discuss this first section in more detail. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. Paul writes, For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then's my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. All right, let's look more closely at what Paul says here. So, the Apostle Paul, in the previous verses and chapters, have just stated that in ministering to the Christians in the church at Corinth, he has not made use of his apostolic authority or rights that he is actually entitled to. Particularly, he has not taken financial support from the church in Corinth. He's taken it from other churches, but he will not take it from the church in Corinth. And he believes that the way he behaves furthers the gospel message. So now he's going to go into more detail about that. And he begins in verse 16 with the Greek word gar, for, which means he's about to give an explanation of why he behaves the way he does. So, for when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I'm compelled to preach. Now, how is Paul compelled? How is he constrained? How is he 
pressed upon to preach the gospel. Well, Paul understands that he has a divine calling from God to preach the gospel. It's not his choice. He didn't choose that vocation for himself. It was thrust upon him. It's a duty that God gave to him. In fact, Paul says that God chose him from his mother's womb to preach the gospel and worked in his life and compelled him and gave him the duty to do it. So it was God's choice, not his. Therefore, he must preach the gospel. And he says he can't boast. Now, we might understand boasting one way today, but you have to understand it in the context of the times of the Apostle Paul in the Roman Empire. It was very common and thought proper for a person in leadership or in aristocracy to boast. Because after all, what you did was you boasted to give right to who you were, to your authority, and to your position so that everybody would recognize who you were and would respect your authority. Now, can you imagine politicians today if they didn't boast? What if a politician said, well, I hope you all vote for me. I really don't deserve it. There's just a lot of good candidates available, and a lot of them better than I am. I'm just an old country lawyer trying to help you people out, so, you know. I may be a simple country hyper chicken, but I know when we're finger licked. If you'd be inclined, maybe you could just vote for me. That's not what we hear. <laughs> what we hear is, I'm the greatest. I've done more than any other human could ever do. Vote for me. Well, that's the way it was done in the Roman Empire, and that was commonly accepted. So when Paul said to the Corinthians, I will not boast, their thought was like, well, what's wrong with you, Paul? If you don't boast, then obviously you're not worthy of being an apostle and a leader in the church. But he says, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. And what I'd like to point out to us is, uh, you know what? I think we're compelled to preach as well. Might ought to think about that. Then Paul says, woe, woe to me. In other words, I'm worthy of divine judgment and punishment if I don't do this. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Now what he implies there is he could have said no. Even though he was compelled, called, God-given duty and authority, he, he could have said no. Do you remember anyone in the Old Testament who said no? A man by the name of Jonah, told to go and preach to the Nedivites? He said no. How'd that work out? Yeah, he got swallowed by a giant fish. So Paul says, no, I'm not going to go the Jonah route. Uh, I'm going to go the way God has directed me. But then he says in verse 17, if I preach voluntarily, and by voluntarily here he means as a free person, if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. And by reward, what he means is, I'm entitled to be paid. I'm entitled to receive wages for preaching the gospel. I'm entitled to that. That's my right. I have that authority to do that. So if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. But if not voluntarily, if I do it as a slave as a household servant, and here he has in mind the manager of a household who has the duty and obligation to rule over a house. You might remember that Jesus said, uh, what you want to hear in the resurrection is, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what Paul has in mind here, that kind of a servant, that kind of a household manager. So he says, if not voluntarily, in other words, I've been called, I've been compelled, I have no choice, I have to do this no matter what. If I am not doing it voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. I'm simply being a good steward. I'm exercising the stewardship that God gave me. 
What then is my reward? I've got to do this. I don't have a choice. Well, then I don't need to get paid. I don't need to have a salary. I don't need to have money from you in order to do this. It's my divine calling. What then is my reward? I'm just having to think. Wouldn't you love to hear some of the televangelists say that? Don't send me any money, folks. I'll get by without my private jet. I'll get by without my five houses. I'll get by without my luxurious wardrobe. I, I'd just love to hear that someday. What then is my reward? What's my pay? What's my wages, Paul says? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it. I may. I, I have the right to do this. I, I can do this. I have the right to deliver it, to offer it free of charge. And so, not to make full use or actually abuse of my rights, my exousia, my authority, my power, my freedom as a preacher of the gospel. So a little ironic twist here, what he's saying is, my pay is to receive no pay. That's my wages. I do. I'm asking for zero, and that's what I want. Now, the Corinthians didn't like that. Now, that may seem strange to us. Why did they not like that? Why were they kind of concerned about that? Well, because they were familiar with what was known as patronage. In other words, as a patron, you know, we hear the expression sometimes, a patron of the arts, and a patron of the arts finds some young, talented painters and gives them money and sponsors their art shows and, and helps them out and all of that. But then you know what that patron does? It begins telling that artist what to paint. And Paul is saying, that's why I won't take money from you, Corinthians. You're not going to be my patrons because you're not going to tell me what to preach. You're not going to tell me how to preach the gospel. I know you'd like to, but you're not going to. So I'm not going to take any money from you folks for your own good so that I may preach the gospel that God has given me truthfully, faithfully, and accurately to you without needing any support financially from you whatsoever. So he declined the offer of patronage. Now, in verses 19 through 23 here, what Paul does is that he explains his use of this freedom. He has the freedom, the exousia, if you will, the freedom to take money or not to take money. He has the authority to choose what he will do, and in that sense, how he will behave before them. So he establishes his rights to waive his rights. And he explains what seems to be, to the Corinthians, an inconsistency in his behavior. Now, in verse 19, he begins giving his key thesis in this whole argument here. Here's the key thesis, and of course, he begins it with what would you expect the word to be? Gar, for, here's the explanation, here's the purpose, here's what I'm talking about. For though I am free, I am free, I'm financially independent of you. And I'm a Roman citizen after all. I am totally free. Though I am free and belong to no one, I'm free from all. I'm not, I don't have any patrons who are paying my way, who've hired me to do what they want me to do. I belong to no one, but I have made myself a slave. I've made myself a household servant, a household manager, a steward. I have made myself your servant. And I'm fine with that. I have made myself a slave to everyone. I'm here to serve others. I'm here not to make money or to get rich. I'm here to give. I'm here to serve. I'm here to humble myself before you. And all I ask is that you hear the message that I have from God for you. 
So I made myself a slave to everyone. That's why my behavior seems inconsistent. Because I'm here to serve others. And I do what they want. And I do what they need. I do what is appropriate for everyone. And why do I do that? To win. To gain. We might say to win over. And this was evidently missionary language of the day to win a convert or to win someone over to your way of thinking. So he says, to win as many as possible. The more the better, but to win as many as possible. And here's how. Now he's going to explain, here's how I do that. Here's how I win over as many as possible. Here's my strategy. Here's how I make myself a slave to everyone. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. Now, Paul was a Jew. But his point here is to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. What does he mean? Well, when he was with Jewish folks, he ate a kosher diet. He went to synagogue on the Sabbath day. He went to the temple. He dressed and acted like a Pharisee. He spoke Aramaic. He recited Torah when he was with the Jews. And he was, of course, still preaching the gospel, but in terms and in ways that were culturally appropriate to the Jewish people. So to those under the law, I became like one under the law, both Jews and Jewish proselytes. So not only to just racially, ethnically Jews, but even those who had converted to Judaism, the Gentiles who had become proselytes, he reached out to them by acting in a proper Jewish manner culturally. So I became like one under the law, though in contrast, I myself am not under the law. Now, he's going, to, he's going to make a play on the word law. Now, I don't know if you've seen this about the Apostle Paul or not, but the Apostle Paul loves puns. He likes to play with language. And he's going to play a little bit here with the word namas. N-O-M-O-S is the basic root word here. Namas, meaning law. In fact, let me read this, substituting the word, forms of the word namas for law. Here's what he says. So I became like a Jew. To those under the namas, I became like one under the namas, though myself am a namas to win those who are namas. To those not having the namas, I became anamos, because uh, though I am anamos, I am in namos. Paul's having a good time here. Now I'll read it in English, but it loses something in English here, but I have to understand. All right, let's go back. So to those under the law became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. Verse 21, to those not having the law, Gentiles, anamos, those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. So he ate what he wanted to eat, anything. He, he could dress differently. He could speak Greek instead of Aramaic. He could do other things that Gentiles would do according to their culture that Jews would never do because it wasn't culturally appropriate for them. So do you understand that Paul could behave culturally one way with Jewish folks and behave culturally a different way with Gentile folks? Why? to win them, to win them over, to gain them, to have them hear the gospel, to give it a chance to be heard and received and responded to. So verse 22, to the weak, I became weak. I relinquished my rights. I relinquished my freedoms. I was strong, but 
to the weak. I didn't come on as strong. I came on as weak like they were. If they didn't eat meat, I wouldn't eat meat. I don't have to eat meat, but if it helps someone, if it will encourage them to listen to me as I share the gospel, I will be weak for them. He says, I have become. Now, interestingly here, he switches to the perfect tense, which means this is perfected. This is the way it is. This is the way I absolutely am. I have become. I'm complete. I'm finished. I'm perfected. I have become all things to all people. Now, you'll hear that quoted a lot. All things to all people. What does, what does he mean? He means in matters of indifference. He's talking about things that are culturally appropriate, culturally acceptable. He's not talking about morals or ethics or the worship of the one true God. He's talking about what we call matters of indifference. The uh, ancients called it adiaphora. But in all of those things, he said, uh, I've become all those things. I can be a meat eater. I can be a vegetarian. I can be a moviegoer. I can not watch movies. I can do this. I can Whatever it takes culturally to reach people, I'm willing to do, even if it means laying aside things that I would prefer and things that I would like. That's not what's important to me. What's important to me is other people and sharing the gospel with them. And he says, I become all things to all people so that, by all possible means, I've really, really tried, Paul says, by all possible means, I might save some. I might rescue them. I might deliver them from the bondage of sin. I might show them the true freedom that is in Christ to save some. Not all. I know it's not God's time for me to call and save every, but all those I can, I do my best, I try. I do all this, verse 23, for the sake of the gospel, on account of the gospel, for the proclamation of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings, that I may be a full participant and a fellow partner with as many people as possible, because Paul might say, we're all in this thing together. And I'm thankful and happy and rejoice to be in it, and whatever it takes to bring you into it, I'm willing to do even if it means things I don't like or personally would not prefer. So what do we learn from the example of the Apostle Paul? Well, we learn for the sake of living and sharing the gospel, we as Christians should be, quote, all things to all people. The first and foremost thing we should be is be like Jesus. As the Apostle Paul could say to fellow Christians, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, Christ showed love to all people, to Jews and to Gentiles, to saints and to sinners. Though he never sinned himself, he showed love and concern for sinners. So a Christian should do all things a Christian can to relate to non-Christians in matters of indifference, things that don't relate to morals, ethics, or worship of the one true God. Now, Christians should not take on the wrong ways of others. That's not what Paul is saying at all here. But Christians should enter into people's lives, share life with them. And if this means laying aside our preferences in matters of indifference, so be it. Now, let me give you a real simplistic example of this, which I hope you'll be able to build on this principle and apply it to other things. But here's a simplistic example. You may have a personal preference for a certain kind of music. Maybe when you attend a neighborhood social gathering, you would prefer to hear Christian music or opera or country or rock or jazz or rap or rhythm and blues or Broadway show tunes. But, now depending on the morality of the lyrics, 
When we engage life with others in the neighborhood, whatever music they like and play, we're going to listen to. We're going to share in it. We're not going to complain and say, well, they're not playing my music. I'm not going to the neighborhood gathering. Whatever music they play, we'll go because we're all things to all people. Even though it's music that sounds like fingernails scratching on a chalkboard or on the fender of a car, ah, we'll go because we're there to share life with others and it's not about our personal preference. When Paul was with his fellow Jews, as I said, he would eat only kosher foods, go to synagogue, speak Aramaic, dress and talk like a Pharisee, and recite from the Torah. When he was with Gentiles, he'd eat anything he wanted to. He would fellowship in the Agora. He would preach and teach on any day of the week. He would speak Greek and recite Greek poetry and quote tenets from Stoic philosophy. And Paul would accept financial support from some churches, and he would not accept financial support from other churches. Why? Everything that Paul did was for the good of other people, not about his personal preferences or even needs. All the Apostle Paul's behaviors were to live and share the gospel appropriately with different people groups so that he might obtain a hearing and a response to the gospel. We as Christians today should follow that example. Paul was criticized for his behavior by some Christians in Corinth who mistakenly thought his differing behavior was hypocrisy. Paul never compromised with the gospel. Paul never compromised with Christian ethics or morality. What Paul did was put the interests of others above his own personal preferences and interests, and we as Christians must do that today. And that's very contrary to today's cultural norms and the influences that we have upon us from the society around us. I mean, perhaps even more than Paul did in his day, today we live in a me culture. It's all about me. In fact, one suggests that we change that song, you know, it's all about Jesus, to it's all about me, Jesus. It's all about me. It's my truth. It's, well, I do what's right for me. Well, I believe my, that's your truth, but I believe my truth. I demand that you acknowledge that and see me the way I see me. This is not the mindset of a Christian. Being a Christian is all about being all things to all people and putting the feelings of others above your own self-oriented attitude. Why? To get to live with others, to share life with others, and to share the gospel with others and hope for a response. As Christians, we follow our leader, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master. We give our lives to Him. We follow His example. And His example was to give away His life for others. We're called to give away our lives for others. Our lives belong to Him. He paid for them. We're His, and we're happy to be so. We live our lives for others. We're here to serve others, to help, to, to encourage, to set an example for others in order to share the gospel when and as appropriate. As with Paul, let us remember that what we do, we do all for the sake of the gospel, that we may share in its blessings with all those into whose lives God may send us to share and make a difference. It's what the Apostle Paul did. It's what Jesus did. It's what we should do as well. So I admonish you, me, all of us. I admonish us, let's go forth 
and let us be all things to all people, that by all means we might save, rescue, help others. Let's live and share the gospel. Amen. Amen.